It's my pleasure to talk today with Professor Robin Darren Young, uh, the Professor of Spirituality at the Catholic University of America. And uh, because I have this chance of short interview with you, I want to cover as many things as possible okay. from <laughs> what you know, from what you are expert in. And if you allow me, I would like to concentrate on four main points which I found in your research projects. Um, and uh, these points are asceticism, uh, spirituality, martyrdom, and also women in theology. But first of all, I want to ask you about impre uh, your impressions from uh, your visit of Ukraine. Is it your first time? And how do you feel about this? Yes, it's my first time in Ukraine. And I'm very pleased to be here. The city is beautiful, and the Ukrainian Catholic University is amazing. Um, it's full of energy, uh, enthusiastic young people, and very welcoming. <laughs> it's very nice to hear that. <laughs> um, and uh, may you briefly mentioned also those people from our university with whom you uh, met before and who worked with you? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, Father Oleg Kindi um, was my student at the Catholic University of America, where he was interested in patrology and early Christianity. And he worked on, he wrote a dissertation on uh, Clement of Alexandria that I directed. And then, while I was teaching at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, uh, Professor Taras Timo uh, was there studying in the Early Christian Studies program. So I knew already two people from here. And during these days, probably you got to know much more. <laughs> yes, that's right. OK, thank you. So let me shift then to uh. your um, research. So let me start from asceticism. It is clear that uh, contemporary uh, culture has hard time with understanding what the asceticism is because of this glorifying of prosperity, because of consumerism, etc. But um, what do you think? How can we reintroduce the value of asceticism nowadays? And can people practice asceticism? without religious dimension, somehow isolated from it? Well, people try. Interestingly, uh, there, is, uh, there is a movement even of people who are non-believers um, in the United States to have a sense of life beyond themselves. Um, but they try to reach this without traditional religion of any form. And then, again, in the United States, and I'm sure also, um, I know in South America and possibly also Europe, um, that there are people who try to practice Buddhism as they understand it in one way or another. So I think the ascetic path of self-discipline and realization of life larger than yourself and a life beyond the mere acquisition of objects um, actually still appeals to people and will always appeal to people. Um, because, in part because Christian asceticism uh, has tended to shut itself away to live in convents or hermitages. Many people don't really know about it. And they don't know that many of the things that they look for in Buddhism or even in non-religious forms of self-discipline and self-realization are actually to be found in the Christian tradition. And in some senses, you know, come from the Christian tradition. So I think it's a matter of, in part, a matter of not knowing, and in a part, a matter of not being able to see beneath some of the problems that they see in religion to um, what it has to offer in a very positive way for their own lives. What do you think could be the role of uh, Eastern Catholic churches like the Grand Catholic Church 
in uh, that regard. Well, you mean in the United States or uh, anywhere? In general, in, in, in with regard to ascetic practices, understanding of asceticism. Well, um, uh, I think that one of the things I've noticed here is that there is a kind of um, that people are who are practicing the ascetic life in some way are also mingling with people who are living what you would consider a regular married or not married life in the world and so there's the possibility to communicate between people who who are living two ways of life so i think that's that's something that's going on here i think that there are a lot of people in the united states who are drawn to Eastern and possibly Ukrainian Catholic forms of devotion uh, that they might associate with um, with ascetic practice, you know, that would come from a monasticism that wasn't so removed from people. Mm -hmm. So, so simply the ability of people to see a devotion um, that they're not familiar with, but that brings them closer to their true selves and to God. That's the point of asceticism. Mm -hmm. Asceticism isn't just discipline for the sake of discipline. It's discipline for the sake of a goal. And mm -hmm. the goal would be to draw closer to those things in life that make you truly happy. But to draw closer to those things, you do need discipline. Um, and where are you going to learn discipline? Well, you learn the discipline of asceticism f mainly from a living tradition. Um, and so more exposure to people who are actually practicing it is, uh, I think, something that Ukrainian Catholic Church can offer to people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But, uh, Professor, what you just said about um, asceticism, it reminds me, uh, it uh, makes for me um, hard to distinguish between asceticism and spirituality. Can you? Uh, provide a uh, certain definition of spirituality that, or are these two? They're close. Um, asceticism really means training. Um, it's a word that, go it's a Greek word obviously and it goes back to the idea of a certain discipline for a sport or for some form of learning. Um, but it it was applied primarily to the monastic life. So that you think of a person who is an ascetic, you think of a person who maybe denies himself or herself certain normal or regular pleasures, or even, uh, or, or, or even um, does not engage in marriage, for instance, or live with a family. Um, but, uh, and that's very traditional in the Catholic Church and, and the Eastern Church generally. Um, but the desire for the goal of asceticism is not limited to people who are monks or nuns. And so that's where I think spirituality comes in, mm -hmm. is that um, it's not, it, it's, um, it takes a while, I think, for anybody to become awake to the Spirit of God. And that involves um, not only training oneself in certain, um, in, in, in certain practices, which we could discuss, and in the life of prayer, um, but it also requires the cultivation of quiet and peace and listening to oneself and another and listening for the Spirit of God. Um, and that takes a long time and it requires a lot of patience. So that's where ascetic practices, whatever they are, um, make the spiritual life possible and then the spiritual life reinforces the ascetic practice, gives it a reward, so to speak. Um, and the reward, of course, is communion. And that would be communion with another person and willingness to listen to others, to, in a sense, to bear up with others, um, and also, of course, to listen to God. Mm -hmm. 
so you are rather positive uh, with regard to the fact which uh, many sociologists of uh, religion admit that nowadays we can see reawakening of spirituality but sometimes it's spirituality without God <laughs> how uh, should uh, we respond to it? it it's kind of challenge for the church that people are interested in spirituality but somehow uh, distance it from the church from uh, maybe from well I thought about this a little bit and um, I think that uh, a religion um, that has confidence and trust in God does not have to worry about a spirituality that proclaims itself to be without God because no spirituality is without God. Um, the people who practice it might think they are, but in actual fact, when a person wants to turn to, when a person wants to discover his or her real deeper self, the self that isn't just an object of advertisement or, um, or a vehicle of, you know, consumer acquisition, when a person wants to discover a true life or a happy life, then God is there. I mean, a Western father said that, Augustine, that the whole time he was young and seeking pleasure and knowledge and so forth, God was with him the whole time guiding him. And eventually he woke up to it. So well, people, we don't really know whether, whether people who seeking spirituality without, so-called so without God, wake up to God or not. We don't know that. And in a sense, we don't have to know because it's God's business. Um, so I think that I think that it's important to listen to people and about this kind of so-called godless spirituality and to be encouraging because, after all, um, in a certain sense, there's very similar paths. And you never know when people will wake up and say, oh, yes, that whole time I was accompanied by God, but I just didn't know it. Okay. Um. But let me switch now to one more point in your research, mm -hmm. and it's um, martyrdom. Yes. And um, of course, you are very much familiar with the profile of martyrs of the ancient Christianity. Do you think martyrdom is possible nowadays? We don't mention, of course, persecution of Christians because I think I think that you also agree with me that this is an example of contemporary martyrdom but uh, because the in general the situation of the church is totally different can we speak about other kinds of martyrdom let let me give you an example from uh, ukrainian context contents, uh, context so just a few months ago uh, some people were shot uh, in a cave during maidan revolution and the president of uh, uh, this university uh, Bishop Boris uh, Gudziak, uh, it was he who called uh, that those people were really martyrs for, who died for certain values, very often under the flag of European uh, Union, but I think that we can say more general, for values of human dignity and so on. Uh, can we use in this context the word martyr? Is it appropriate? and uh, are there any other similar contexts? The word martyr is a very interesting word because, of course, it means witness. Uh, and its original meaning was a witness in a trial um, in, Roman, in the Roman world, a witness in a, a, witness in a ju regular judicial trial. And then in the context of Second Temple Judaism, it came to mean someone who gave a witness to God and a witness to the requirements of God to live in a certain way in this world. Um, so giving a wit not just giving a true witness in court, but giving a witness to God in front of human beings. That's the core meaning of, a core theological meaning of martyrdom. 
And that meaning passed into early Christianity, of course, uh, because, uh, because of the teachings of Jesus, that his own disciples would be on occasion called to give a witness. And he very well knew that that witness uh, might involve their deaths. Um, uh, um, so I think that, that the, the idea of martyrdom and the term of martyrdom has always been broader than just persecution. But the thing is that some, in some times or some conditions, giving a witness to God or, and to Jesus um, will draw down persecution because it says in the gospel that Jesus is a sign of contradiction. And so sometimes that sign of contradiction draws the hostility of people. Um, and then that will result in, in actual persecution. But I think witness is very broad and it just means telling the truth. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it means telling the truth and the consequence is death. But the consequence doesn't always have to be death. Um, in the Christian and Catholic and Orthodox traditions, martyrdom has meant people who gave a witness and died for it faithfully. Um, but I would want to retain the wider meaning because sometimes people who give a witness are, um, are uh, they do so with a certain amount of bravery not knowing that they're going to die, but just because out of their love for God and Jesus. And so I think it's important to retain that meaning too. Um, at the same time, there is a very large amount of persecution of Christians right now, and undoubtedly there is martyrdom in that. So there is a continuity with the past, but also I think a broader sense of the term martyrdom or witness. Um, thank you for your answer, which reveals a lot of things. But um, yeah, it was more radical way of uh, living theology. But let uh, us return to maybe more ordinary circumstances. Theology in academia, mm -hmm. and uh, especially uh, women who are involved in doing theology. What do you think about this? Is it um, is uh, what is their role? Do they propound a different uh, way of theologizing, or this is just a matter of equality and uh, keeping balance between male and female theologians? Can they propound something new? What what is lacking in the way of theologizing, which is uh, done by mail? Well, I think that would really depend on the field. Um, I think particularly in fields like Christian ethics mm -hmm. and in pastoral care, mm -hmm. then um, women who are theologians bring both a general training that they share with everybody, but then a particular perspective of women um, but that perspective might vary from country to country and tradition to tradition. You know, um, it's uh, because uh, I don't really think there's any such thing as one general theology. I mean, I'm a Roman Catholic, and the Roman Catholic Church has tended to stress uniformity. <laughs> um, but actually, theology really really is different from country to country, from language to language. And if you appreciate that, then you can also appreciate that the people who study and write theology also reflect their own experience. So whether or not women and men are equal intellectually, and I think we are, um, they have different experiences because of the different social realities. And so I think women's voices are extremely important in theology as women's voices. Um, and, and I think the tradition has always recognized this. You know, I, I study the fourth century a lot, and there were women in the fourth century who were ascetics, 
um, and some of whom read theology, what we would now call theology, they called it philosophy, um, and scriptural exegesis. And then, of course, in the medieval period, we have women actually writing theology, like the great Saint Hildegard of Bingen in Germany. Um, and her writing is extremely distinctive, and in a sense, in some ways, you know, self-taught, um, because she didn't participate in the medieval schools. Um, and her, her, um, her writing, while idiosyncratic, is very valuable writing because it's a testimony to a particular perspective. And I think, and now, you know, maybe this is because I'm a woman and a mother, but I think that God likes variety. <laughs> and so the various experiences that women have and that men have are rightly reflected in theology. So I guess I'm in favor of a, cert a certain a certain communion, but also very distinctive experiences of persons who are, which are reflected in theology. So you can see from my answer that I really like personalist theology and philosophy, and, um, and I, think this is, um, I think this is very valuable. So sometimes women have had a problem, you know, getting a hearing. Sometimes it's hard for women to be listened to. Uh, but then I think that's a matter of women encouraging each other and really making it very plain that we have something particular and general to offer. So that's what I would say about that. Can you exemplify it with your own experience? I know that you have a huge family. How does it uh, influence, influence the way you do your theology? and? Also, from the practical point of view, how you can combine such a deep research and also family responsibilities. Because I think this is one of the reasons why uh, Ukrainian f uh, women are um, feel maybe a bit uncomfortable staying in academy, and there are not so many uh, women theologian, uh, theologians uh, in this. Even in this university, I would say. Yes. So how do well, you that's a long certain? story, but um, number one, having a lot of children, and um, and then having, you know, a spouse who also works. This is um, this this is kind of a matter of asceticism because this if you have a lot of children, you're not going to you know you're not you're not going to get rich, <laughs> especially being an academic theologian. Um, so. Uh, so, you know, there's a certain amount of teaching and, um, and positive ascetic practice that goes on in the home uh, because everybody has to give and everybody has to watch out for the other person. And that's a matter of learning. We don't just automatically do that as human beings. We have to learn how to do it and how to love each other, really. Um, so I think that learning to love each other in the home is really important. Um, and it, it, um, it also, it definitely affects the way you teach. You know, I, I certainly think of, I certainly, I don't, um, I, I, I don't think of my students as my children exactly, but I, I have, I think I like to see them grow up, so to speak. I'm very proud of my students when they, when they do grow up, like Oleg <laughs> and um, Taras. And, um, and so I think that there's a certain way in which family life really contributes to the nurturing of students, which is a really important part of university life. As for scholarship, well, you just have to be able to stay up late and work hard. And, and there you have to learn how to use your time very well. Um, and you also have to be patient because you realize that the major research that you want to carry out and when you get ideas of in graduate school and so forth, well, maybe you have to do it bit by bit. You know, maybe you have to do it over the long haul. And this is actually a problem for women because um, typically men have been able to get started earlier and then when they get their appointments, you know, they're ready with their products and so forth. And that's the way the system is really set up especially the theological system is set up largely for single men. But, you know, um, there are ways to work around this and 
then I think that your, the life you live with your family um, really contributes to the insight that you have um, and maybe also to the imagination and sympathetic imagination that you exercise toward these texts that are so, you know, ancient. In my case, I work with the ancient texts. And then, you know, you have, your family has to be willing to kind of put up with these strange people like Evagrius of Pontus or Hildegard of Bingen who also live in the house with your children. <laughs> uh, and then ultimately, of course, your children grow up and you've had that great happiness of raising children. Um, and you turns out you can still be a scholar. So I think it's a matter of just a different arrangement of time. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that um, you know, having, um, enjoying the mutual support with your husband is, that, that contributes a lot too. And so um, I, have to, I have to give what in America they call a shout out to my husband, you know. I also think it would be good if um, there were more support at the community and government level for working women because we make a tremendous contribution to society, uh, but that's still something to work on. <laughs> so. <laughs> But I encourage you. I encourage young women theologians. You know, if they have a if they have a vocation to family life, to go ahead and have children because it's a great, great happiness. Uh, Professor, thank you so much. Uh, your this your experience is uh, really very encouraging. <laughs> and thank you for a nice uh, talk. And um, thank you. All those valuable things which you mentioned, and hope to see you again in our university. Well, I hope to come back. Thank you. Thank you so much.